All 8 billion of us are doing metabolism at all times. This show is about learning what metabolism is, how it affects you in every way possible from mood and mental state to performance and energy. We are all about fine-tuning the human experience for you to achieve the best self you can be. And if you are someone who loves science, curious to know how your body works and how to optimize it, then you are in the right place. This is the HVMN Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the HVMN Podcast. And I'm your host, Dr. Lat Mansour, a PhD in physiology, anatomy, and genetics, and the research lead of health via modern nutrition. And if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a review. And if you have any question, leave us a comment. And as always, we appreciate it if you can share it with a friend. Now, without further ado, let's get into this episode of HVMN Podcast. In this episode, we have Dr. Tommy Wood, MD, PhD, who is a neuroscientist and professional nerd who has coached world-class athletes in a dozen sports. He received an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, a medical degree from the University of Oxford, and a PhD in physiology and neuroscience from the University of Oslo. Tommy is currently an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington, where his research focuses on brain injury and brain health across the lifespan, as well as developing easily accessible and equitable methods with which to track health, performance, and longevity in both professional athletes and the general population. In this episode, we discussed everything about brain health, how to mitigate brain injury, how metabolism play a role in the severity of brain injury, as well as tips and advice to maintain brain function while we age. So I am sure you will definitely enjoy this entertaining episode. So stay tuned. Hello, we have Dr. Tommy Wood here today with us on Health Via Modern Nutrition Podcast. Thank you very much for coming on. How are you, Tommy? I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm. I'm really looking forward to to chatting you, with you about all kinds of random stuff. I imagine. Yeah, all kind of random stuff. And <laughs> and Tommy and I, we've met before. Uh, the first time we met was we we met. We worked out together at um, yeah, the, gym, the gym at the hotel gym. Yeah, best place and to the, meet. Exactly, Metabolic Health Summit last year, where both of us presented as well. Uh, and then turned out we've got similar backgrounds. Um, he and I went to University of Oxford as well. So why don't we give a little bit of introduction to our audience and just tell them who you are, what you do? Sure. Uh, so my main role currently is I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics and neuroscience at the University of Washington. I run a basic neuroscience lab looking at ways to treat uh, the injured brain, both in newborn and pediatric brain injuries, and then also traumatic brain injury. And I Additionally, have an interest in long-term cognitive function, cognitive decline, and dementia. Um, kind of what got me there, um, I obviously grew up in the UK. I have an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge. I then went to me medical school at the University of Oxford, like you said. Um, and then I worked as a junior doctor in London for a couple of years before doing my PhD in physiology and neuroscience at the University of Oslo. Then I moved over to the US as was a postdoc and then became a, a faculty a few years ago. Such an overachiever. <laughs> Oxford <Yeah>. and Cambridge. <laughs> just to add it onto the list. It just makes it really difficult to know who to cheer for in the boat race. Uh, <laughs> that's the main thing. Uh, although this year, Cambridge won all the, like, all the races. Oh, did they? Oh, that's why I didn't know. Because I didn't hear any news. I didn't. I, otherwise, they will, they'll send all the alumni emails around. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, like I think it's the third time ever there's been a clean a clean sweep like that. Oh boy, that would be that must be fun in Oxford. Yeah, um, and so uh, alongside I guess alongside that, and this is one of the, one of the reasons that we have overlapping interests. Um, I've had this sort of like academic career in basic neuroscience um, as well as my medical training, but I've worked a lot with with athletes in various guises. So as a as a coach first mainly with with rowers uh, when i was uh, in medical school and then i uh, was part of a a company that that worked with athletes on all aspects of improving their their health and performance so we did a whole bunch of blood tests and various other things and looked at nutrition and lifestyle and you know how we could create sustained performance um and so nowadays I, I still do a bit of that. I prim primarily work with uh, Formula One drivers as a performance consultant for a company called Hintzer Performance that works with about half the F1 drivers on a grid uh, every year. Um, and then I sort of do that 
uh, alongside my sort of main academic work. That's super interesting because you are literally covering both the performance side as well as the therapeutic side. And I always tell people on this platform, on this podcast as well, that performance and therapeutic areas or performance and disease areas are essentially on the same spectrum is just one group of people do metabolism better and then the other group have dysfunction in their metabolism. So Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and and one of the things that's really stood out to me from working, you know, basic science with humans in disease populations and, and performance related populations is that the same like core things are important for be it metabolic health or overall health that are also required, particularly for sustained athletic performance. Like you can you know, you can really burn the candle at both ends to get performance in one season. But if you want to repeat that year after year after year, you you know, you really need to have the same kind of fundamentals in, in place. And that's that's kind of the same regardless of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. And as well as when it comes to aging, it goes the other way around as well. You know, you've got to be um, really cognizant of muscle strength and muscle muscle mass and brain and all of that. And um, I don't know if I've updated you. Um, I We are actually running a pilot study on TBI, traumatic brain injury using ketone IQ with the Naval Health Research Center. So um, we got a chat after this um, regarding if you, you're working on any any studies actually. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. We, yeah, we have, a, uh, we have a, a TBI model in, in our lab that, that we're doing some, some work on. And though... I haven't used ketones in that respect. I, I do have used them in one of my other in, uh, brain injury models because, um, well, I mean, I don't think the listeners need to be told about all the potential benefits that ketones have have for the brain, um, except for the one that I'm most interested in um, is related to the developing brain, but I think it's also related to the injured brain, regardless of where you are in your in your lifespan, which is that if you give a brain the option of ketones and glucose it will pr and it needs to perform some kind of growth or repair process the, those ketones are preferentially used for growth and repair so particularly creating new membrane structures creating new cholesterol um, and the developing brain does that um, so so if you're trying to repair sections of brain you know it makes sense that the ketones would not only are they you know, see if they're anti-inflammatory or providing a metabolic fuel, you know, they could also be substrate for the actual like physical uh, repair of various areas of the brain. So lots of lots of interesting things there. That's great. This is amazing. This is amazing knowledge. So let's dive into what are you currently working on? What are your current research projects these days? So there are there are two main things that, you know, we write grant proposals, and then we have funded work that 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 pay, pays for most of what happens in the lab, pays for the experiments, pays for the, the stuff. Um, and so two things that I'm currently working on. One is uh, using azithromycin, which is a, it's an antibiotic yeah. that has potential neuroprotective prop properties because it modulates microglia, which are the main immune cells in the brain. It makes them less pro-inflammatory and more sort of regulatory or anti-inflammatory in the setting uh, of a brain injury so i'm testing that in a model that we have of preterm brain injury so babies born preterm have a significantly increased risk of long-term neurodevelopmental impairment uh, so that can be learning difficulties cerebral palsy things like that um, and so we have a model of that and we have a, a grant uh, to, to test azithromycin as a, as a neuroprotective agent in that setting so that's one thing we're working on and then in our uh, traumatic brain injury model, uh, we have some DOD funding to test a device that will uh, increase intracranial pressure at the moment of impact to try and mitigate the effect of the impact itself. Um, so you're kind of you're not treating an injury, you're like almost preventing that injury from happening uh, in the first place. And there's some nice rodent data that supports this idea. But we're doing this in the ferret, which is, I think, a better model uh, of the of the brain for various reasons that we could talk about if you want uh, so we have a device we're paired with a, a, a local company that developed a developed a device uh, to do this and that's that's another thing that we're working on right now okay well let's talk about it actually why is a ferret brain more of a an appropriate brain model uh for the for this study so the there are there are two main reasons why i think the the model that we have is a good one the first is the the animal model itself and the ferret is the smallest mammal that has a gyrified brain. Um, and that's probably a bunch of stuff that people may not have heard about before. So if you, you've probably seen, you know, 
anybody listening to this has probably seen some kind of cartoon or picture at least of the human brain and it's really wrinkly right it has all these folds these are called gyri and what some people may not know is that rodents mice and rats which is what most basic science neuroscience is done in they do not have those they have a completely smooth brain i thought smooth brain is just a meme so it's a real thing it's a real thing they have, they call they so so like uh humans uh and ferrets are gyroencephalic they're their brains that have gyri whereas things like rodents and rabbits they're lysencephalic they have smooth completely smooth brains the reason why this is important is because particularly for a blast injury and for repetitive uh, traumatic brain injury like CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, where you get the injury in the brain is, a, is in the sulci, which is at the base of those folds, at the interface between the gray matter, which kind of sits on the outside, and the white matter, which is what is responsible for all these fast connections between different areas of the brain that sits just underneath uh, the, the the outer cortex, the gray matter, and you see the pathology at the intersection at the sulci at the intersection of these parts of the brain. So, one of the reasons why the ferret, I think, is a, is a better model is because the ferret has those structures and rodents don't. So it's difficult to model an injury in a structure that doesn't exist in in uh, in, in a brain. So that's one of the reasons why why we think the the ferret is important. Um, more broadly, we do a closed head injury model. Um, a lot of traumatic brain injury models in rodents open up the skull and then cause an injury to the, to the brain directly, mm -hmm. hit something against the brain. However, um, that again, doesn't really mimic what you see in most concussions or traumatic brain injuries, unless you get, you have some kind of penetrating trauma, right? Something sort of enters into the skull, then that's relevant. But if you're trying to, again, create an injury in the same area in the same way that's relevant to people getting concussions, you know, as athletes or in the military, then a closed head model is is important. So that that's why, you know, we believe the the, the ferret is a good model to, to try try some of these therapies and other strategies. On. Interesting. So you know, you talked about the mechanistically way of of mitigating the damage, right? Let's talk about metabolically. You know, what can you do or what do you understand so far? What do we understand as, as the scientific community, as, as the human race? What do we understand so far? What happens in terms of metabolism when you have a brain injury? How can you prevent it? How can you mitigate it? How can you recover better from it? Yeah, there's loads of great questions in there and we can sort of go, we can go one by one. There's a bunch of really interesting physiology, which is what, there's two things that I'm really interested in when it comes to traumatic brain injury one is how can we make the physiology of the individual more resilient to an impact that's going to happen right you you have a certain type of job it's almost guaranteed at some point this is going to happen right so in those individuals how do we set them up to minimize that effect and then there's how do we manage the physiology afterwards to minimize the negative effect of any impact and so you mentioned metabolism we can we can start there in animal models and there was some data from humans as well though it's difficult to to get um so so in in animal models regardless of how you create a traumatic brain injury could be blast could there are a bunch of different models that can do this if you have um glucose dysregulation you create some kind of either a type 2 diabetes model or a type 1 diabetes model um if they if the animal is hyperglycemic before the insult occurs then they have a worse outcome. And you see something, you know, when they've done similar studies in, in uh, humans, so like there's been studies looking at, looking at veterans who, had a, who have had a traumatic brain injury and those who were hypertensive or had type 2 diabetes or some evidence of metabolic uh, syndrome first, they had worse outcomes. Why this is important is mainly because even, you know, we, we might... You know, people are listening to this for people like, yeah, of course, you have you have worse blood sugar control, worse metabolic health, you have a worse outcome after a traumatic brain injury. So then a lot of people in the types of jobs that we're thinking about, so high level athletes of certain types, people in the military, what they might not appreciate is how common it is to have poor metabolic health, even in those populations. So there are there have been studies looking at division one collegiate football players, 
right? Some of the best football players at their level in the country. You know, so then you might think, right, the 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 bigger players, the linemen, right? We you, you might expect them to have some components of metabolic syndrome, and it, that is very common, right? They're going to hit the waist circumference target. Some of them are going to be hypertensive, pre-diabetic. But even in the athletic and skilled groups, so quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, you know, these are lean, strong, fast uh, athletes. They're a tank even of in, muscles. Yeah, exactly. When they've looked at them, about somewhere between 20 and 30% still have, say, pre-diabetic blood sugar. Wow. Which is insane because you kind of think, well, this is a – this is a strong, fit individuals. Like they, they must have perp. They must have great metabolic health. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And there are other studies that have looked at rugby players, um, elite level, um, like throwers, throwers, uh, you know, like track and field athletes, uh, judo players, and particularly in those that are in the open weight classes or heavyweight or you know weight unlimited classes, it is very common that they have full metabolic syndrome, if not non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, at least pre-diabetes, hypertension, even at elite international athlete level. Um, and not necessarily in those who who have a body composition that might suggest poor metabolic health, right? There's a, there was a study in uh, like university level rugby players in Japan. These guys had a BMI like 28 on average, but only 20% body fat, right? Which isn't that much. And even in them, there was a high preponderance of some of the 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 um sort of categories of metabolic syndrome okay before we go further into that why do you think that is because yesterday i was interviewed on another podcast um i think gut, gut talk girls a podcast and we were just talking that uh, about you don't need to look sick to be sick right you don't need to look like you have metabolic syndrome to have metabolic syndrome and it goes to show that exercise and exercise alone like these people are very active and exercise alone may not be able to prevent chronic diseases and metabolic syndrome altogether. Like the other aspects of life um, that you are not doing exercises, like if, if you're working out six hours a day, there's still so many more hours that you're not doing exercises. And, and those hours matter as far as how you ma manage your sleep, manage your stress, manage your nutrition and all that. So tell me, why do you think that there's such a shocking number with these athletes having metabolic syndrome? So I think there's a few potential reasons, and, and you kind of mentioned um, several of them there. Um, often when you're looking at these individuals, right, they are student athletes, which means they're students. Um, and so some of it may be related to sleep, right? They're not sleeping. We know that could affect blood sugar regulation. Um, a lot of it may be related to diet quality. The, you know, you don't know what they're eating, but if they're eating like a typical student, which a lot of them are, we know there's a whole bunch of issues associated with that, both in terms of the quality of the food, the quality of the carbohydrates and the other macronutrients in the food, but then whether or not they have adequate micronutrient intake may affect this as well. So particularly non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease, which is common in uh, the larger athletes, we know one potential issue with that is a low choline intake. So if they're not eating adequate choline, you can't shuttle fatty acids out of the liver and they kind of accumulate. So it could be you know, macronutrition, micronutrition, sleep, stress is, is another factor that, that potentially uh, comes into it. Sort of a, uh, there's a, at, the, at the other end, there has certainly been some recent studies that show that overtraining may result in blood sugar dysregulation and insulin resistance. So it's, it could be that some individuals have gone too far in the other direction and it's causing some, some metabolic issues. So any and all of that could be coming into play. Very interesting. I'm just thinking overtraining, increasing insulin sense and in, in, insulin resistance. There was a paper in Cell Metabolism uh, where they where they did high intensity interval training overtraining, and they showed decreasing insulin sensitivity when when the uh, when they were overtrained. Is it because the body feels that it, it needs to go on a catabolic state and therefore you know not taking in the glucose so that they can go further and go faster for, because that's what the body expects you to do because you're already overtrained. Is that, is that why? That, that, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, from a signaling perspective, we know that um, reactive oxygen species modulate the sensitivity of, sensitivity of the insulin receptor, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're creating a huge oxidative stress burden and not 
recovering from that that's going to signal back to the insulin receptor to decrease uh, sensitivity so like there's this di direct in interplay between you know metabolic rate oxi oxidative stress production and, and insulin sensitivity that you can you know so a small amount is beneficial right your mitochondria increase their metabolic rate that uh, increases ox uh, reactive oxygen species that signals to the insulin receptor to make it more sensitive but then it's a u-shaped curve so you can get to the point where it sort of increases even more and then uh, uh, receptor sensitivity decreases that that is a, a very good point like your mitochondria will first and foremost prioritize survivability and protection um, especially when you increase the oxidative stress to a certain level where it may induce apoptosis or cell death um, so it needs to then stop taking in all the substrates in order to put us halt to metabolism because ultimately organs and cells with higher metabolism they have higher rate of um ross generation so that that is just a, a numbers game so that makes sense it's i mean insulin sensitivity is essentially or insulin resistance in general is a self-protective mechanism either mm -hmm. because of ex exposure to excess metabolic substrates such that it's like energy toxic or at the other end you know not being able to deal with additional capacity so you try and you try and turn down metabolic rate so yeah that makes perfect sense great 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 so okay um one one you know you answer one of the questions about metabolism and preventing um brain injury and not having metabolic syndrome or, or being metabolically healthy will ultimately help people from recovering uh help people to recover better from um, brain injury. What else um, is happening in the brain when they go through injury? Like from my research, what I found is that during the first 48 hours or so, they see a hypermetabolism of glucose, right? Um, they The brain takes in a lot more glucose. Some scientists says it's for metabolism. Some scientists says it's being shoved into the pentose phosphate pathway to create an ADPH to then help with the mitigation and recovery. Um, and then seven days or, or a few days after that, glucose metabolism goes down, lactate metabolism goes really high, um, showing the this regulation of a substrate metabolism. And then over time as well, they start to develop some form of insulin resistance and glucose hypometabolism. Um, is that in line with what, what you found, Tommy? Yeah, I think that's definitely, that's definitely uh, possible. There's... Um there's sort of like multiple waves of of effect after after an injury and the the period of time that i'm most interested in is that sort of immediately afterwards and the hours afterwards and what you what you see is an initial sort of hypometabolism it pseudo normalizes and then as the sort of injury accumulates you get some cell death some uh, mitochondrial dysfunction then you get this decrease in metabolic rate again this was sort of like talking in the hours after the injury but what happens is there en the, there ends up being this gap so even if total metabolic rate increases and it does and that's usually associated with things like fever and an inflammatory response to the injury you still have decreased uh, capacity to produce energy because you have mitochondrial damage so you have this gap between this increasing demand and this your decreasing ability to, to supply it which is then in the setting of trying to mitigate an injury where people have become really interested in manipulating temperature so things like hypothermia after concussion and so my phd was in the effect of temperature on brain injury that was is essentially what i focused on and in concussion and traumatic brain injury, hypothermia, so you, you decrease the, the temperature of the animal and ideally the human, it works really well in traumatic brain injury models to decrease injury. Wow. It's been tested. And, and how long How long that has to be like between? Yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. And one of the reasons, you know, the, the people still debate, um, it probably needs to be initiated within hours ideally within two or three Put hours them in the cold plunge yeah um but and then last at least 24 hours if not 72 so the there is one type of brain injury where hypothermia is standard of care um which is neonatal term hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy which is something happens around childbirth there's a decrease of, of blood and oxygen to the brain and then those babies have a like deranged 
brain function, that's what we call encephalopathy, and they get cooled to 33.5 degrees Celsius core temperature for 72 hours as part of international resuscitation guidelines. There is no other brain, brain injury where that's been shown to be protective. Some places do it after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Some places do it with traumatic brain injury. Some places have been tried with stroke. In the big randomized controlled trials, it has not worked in, in humans, um, which has been kind of surprising because it works so well in animal models. Part of the discrepancy is that the most important thing is is not cooling the brain down. It's preventing a fever. Okay. So it's preventing this increase in metabolic rate above normal due to an inflammatory response. So if you have a really tightly well-controlled clinical trial where in the control group you prevent fever, then actively cooling down the intervention group doesn't seem to give you much benefit. And if there is a benefit, it's very small. So the main thing to do is to prevent a fever. And this is important because, say, if you're an athlete or you know, you're know you on the battlefield or in some other scenario where you get some kind of injury, it's often in a heat-stressed environment. So you're already heat-stressed. So the, one of the most important things is to try and de remove that heat stress. So a lot of people have tried to cool down the brain and there's like caps and collars and things like that. None of it's really been shown to work so far. I would love it if a trial came out to show that it did work. It hasn't been shown to work so far. But preventing a fever, getting people out of a heat stress environment is really important. And that's probably going to be important for at least two or three days um, after the injury. Again, to prevent that sort of increase in metabolic demand that the mitochondria in the neurons aren't, aren't able to meet because then that's what then that can then cause worse cell death or worse injury that's that's super interesting because that kind of answered my my follow-up question because i was like you know isn't inflammation in that sense like good in the sense that it's sending the right signals and and the repair signals and you know all the recovery signals that we need and you kind of answered it you know quite nicely that we're not preventing the inflammation per se we're preventing the increase in temperature and the increase in demand of me uh, metabolism that that the mitochondria can't keep up with so speaking of which um this reminds me of um uh a, a guy named james um he reached out to us because his son had um uh, his son sort of drowned um at, almost drowned when he was a baby and now he's six he he still needs like tubing and all that he had you know brain injury um and and i sent him some ketone iq to try and he said like he definitely felt that the son his son is way more alert and all of that and i wonder um if you have you know in your area of expertise tommy if you have any advice for him um, and james if you're listening here um i wish you all all the best as well and, and for your son yeah it's um it's it's really tricky and th this is probably like depending on exactly when this happened um in in his life this you know it, this is probably not unlike that scenario we talked about some issue right around birth decreased oxygen and blood flow to the brain and you know that's exactly that's what yeah. that's what reminded me of yeah yeah v very similar um and actually there are some scenarios even when if, if, if that happened nowadays some people may may cool uh, even though there aren't randomized controlled trials to say it, they may say, you know, this is similar enough that maybe we'll try it, especially if you can start treating it early enough after resuscitation. Um, so what then comes, you know, six six or several years later, um, it, it, it kind of depends on, you know, I, I don't know if there's seizures, if that's the case, then, you know, I think there's, there's some good rationale about why ketones may be beneficial. Um, I think... Um, one of the things that we know is most important for um, for brain injured infants is stimulus, and this is actually important for the brain all the time. and And one of my favorite things to talk about is why it's important to stimulate the brain. But there are lots of studies in various types of uh, neonatal brain injury where, even if the injury is quite severe, if there's a lot of stimulus, you know, reading playing, movement, physical therapy, um, you know, again, depending on the scenario, there definitely seems to be, you know, a, a big difference or a big improvement in the long-term outcomes. Um, and another important thing to, to remember is that even if um, an infant looks quite, you know, has a significant disability or impairment early in life, that doesn't necessarily mean that will always be the case. Um, 
de- again, depending on the severity of injury. But there's, there's been some nice studies. So we mentioned preterm brain injury before. If you have a preterm brain injury, but you go home into a well support, well supported, enriched environment, that brain injury may have no effect on your long term development. So really, the most important thing is engagement, stimulus, physical therapy, all that kind of stuff. Um, at, at this point, and uh, there's there's a large scope to to improve things, even if you know there's there's some significant impairment. I get to interview all these doctors, scientists, and cool people in this health and fitness industry, all made possible because of this podcast that is funded by the company I work for, which is Health Via Modern Nutrition or HVMN. And it is not that they pay me to do this, but I genuinely love and believe in the product Ketone IQ. I use it every day before my podcast, before my workout, or even after my workout for recovery. There hasn't been a single supplement that can give me such a drastic change in subjective feel within minutes as much as Ketone IQ has. For those of you who do not know me, I'm from Malaysia, I got my PhD from the UK, and my passion is in science and chronic diseases, and I believe it is all about transparency, scientific integrity, and about sharing with everyone so that everyone can benefit from it. And if you like this content and our work, please do support us by liking, leaving a review, or sharing with your friends and families, or even buying a shot of Ketone IQ at any Sprouts nationwide in the US, and the first shot is on us. Just scan the QR code and you'll get your money back for your first shot. You can also use the code HVMNPOD20, that is HVMNPOD20, and get 20% off your first purchase at the HVMN website. Thank you so much for that advice, um, Tommy. And would that advice also carry through for people in the elderly population who, is go- who might be going through neurodegeneration? Because one of the jokes that, you know, I don't know if you'd, you've heard of it, but when I was a student, we always make the joke, it's like all these professors, they, they never retire, they never get old, they, they never get like senile, they're, they're always living forever, they go from <laughs> professor pro- to professor emeritus and, you know, they're going to kill me. But... Um, we are saying that because they get so much stimulus, they are like constantly doing this research and reading these papers and going through um, these students and having to design a study so that they they kept being active rather than just at home watching TV and, and let the brain degenerate. Uh, yeah, I, I feel very strongly that that's, that that's the case. And there's a huge amount of evidence to support this. Um, All these old professors. I- all these old, so my dad is one of those he's 77 he's a professor at oxford um, and he's still there <laughs> he's still there um still writing grants still has students still in the lab there you go still cycle still still cycles to work the um, positions will yeah. not be open anytime <laughs> soon <laughs> um but yes yeah, so, so uh, a colleague of mine uh josh turknet who's a neurologist uh, we actually recently wrote a paper on this exact thing called the what we call the demand model and the the paper is called demand drives neurodegeneration basically the idea being, i saw that paper i saw you yeah. post that paper so so the idea being that um and the, the way to kind of frame it we compare it to uh, like muscle and and like both skeletal muscle and the heart with physical activity or exercise and people i think understand that if you want to be bigger stronger fitter you need to exercise right um and there's a whole bunch of evidence that suggests that when you stimulate a tissue particularly skeletal muscle say not only do you increase um adaptations that allow for better performance you know mitochondrial biogenesis um angiogenesis right new blood vessels so you can so you can supply more blood and oxygen to those muscles but you also upregulate things like autophagy and repair mechanisms and all that kind of stuff, right? If you want to, if you want to stimulate autophagy in your muscles, the best way to do it is not to fast for three days; it's to exercise for thirty minutes, and you can get the same amount of autophagy in thirty minutes of exercise as you can in three days of fasting. Um, and so, stimulating a tissue not only does it create increased function, it also creates increased autophagy and repair. And the brain is essentially exactly the same. And you can see, uh, so in, uh, in animal models, if you create what we call environmental enrichment, you stimulate the environment, it's neuroprotective, right? It protects the brain both from like a traumatic brain injury or it prevents uh, uh, neurodegeneration, both by increasing the number and strength of uh, the connections between neurons, but 
um, also by increasing things like autophagy and repair. Um, in humans, we know things like if you lose um, lose an input, a cognitive stimulus, you see increased cognitive decline. So if you uh, lose your hearing, you have a, a, a faster cognitive decline, you're more likely to get dementia. If you lose sight, again, the same thing. Importantly, those things are reversible. So if you then get cataract surgery or you get a hearing aid, that risk is reversed. So you decrease the stimulus to the brain, increased risk of cognitive decline, but you can reverse that if you add that stimulus back. Um, there are multiple population studies that show as soon as you retire, that's the fastest period of cognitive decline because, our, like you said, our main cognitive stimulus comes through work. Um, and the, you know, we could talk about other things like different types of um, physical activity. So we know that physical activity is beneficial for the brain. This seems to be more protective if it has some kind of stimulating cognitive component. So if you're playing a ball sport, right, you're having to react. We call that like an open skill sport. Uh, dancing is is better than some kind of circuit training that has the same amount of physical stimulus but doesn't have that same kind of coordinative motor balance um, uh, component. So the, uh, we know that languages are, are protective, you know, le learning and speaking multiple languages, again, that's, that's greater cognitive stimulus. We know that people who have um, greater or more years of education, even though that's confounded by socioeconomic status, more education is protective against long-term cognitive decline, again, cognitive stimulus. Those people who play musical instruments, they have younger looking brains because, again, it's a cognitive stimulus. So all the evidence lines up in my mind to say that the most important thing for protecting your brain long term is to stimulate it um in those various ways so the best takeaway from here is like never retire just keep never retire on working um, and learn a musical instrument or learn a language or learn a skill all super important and it's it's, it's super interesting because like um my my family always make fun of me because you know i you know, you would understand this, you know, because we spent so much time in school and education student. that we we didn't get into the workforce until I was like thirty, and they're like, "Well, you you ain't retiring anytime soon because you got to provide for the you know to the family now." Um, so <laughs> I I won't be retiring anytime soon. Um, but I did you know I took up ballroom and Latin dancing back at Oxford? I didn't, but that's I, amazing. Like dance, like if if you look at all the potential things that you can do to like improve brain function or pr protect cognitive function like dancing is the best one wow what about the knees though you know you get to a certain age you know you, you gotta you, you gotta look after the knee <laughs> oh god i'm confident that with a well-structured training program your knees will be just fine right right I, I did try to pick it up again here in san francisco but i just didn't have the time so i might have to pick it up again you know from this conversation and i did learn multiple languages because i had to learn multiple languages growing up um my mom spoke to us in cantonese my dad spoke to us in malay and they both speak english to each other and then i learned spanish uh and thai um and and like after high school i learned thai and then in university i learned spanish as well so, so you're in you're in pretty good shape. I, uh, for now, <laughs> like I'm half Icelandic, so I learned Icelandic. I lived in Germany and France as a kid. When I went to, when I was um, doing my PhD, I was in Norway. I had to teach medical students in Norwegian. So oh my god, yeah. So so that's the difference. When you have to learn a language, that's one thing. But when you have to use that language professionally and utilize it in that way, that's a whole different level. And there's there's something there's actually an important takeaway there, which is. Um, so this kind of skill development, I think, is really important throughout the entire lifespan for to protect cognitive function long term, right? You can't just do the same thing again and again and again. Because then it becomes no the longer, same. Yeah, yeah it's, no, it's no longer it's no longer a stimulus. But when you look at sort of like the basic research of learning and neuroplasticity in adults, you know, we always say, oh, you can't teach a dog, like old dog new tricks and all this kind of stuff. Or it's like, I'm old, so it's really difficult for me to learn new things. Part of it is because we're not giving it the same time and attention as we do when we're younger. But part of it is that there does seem to be a, a little bit more inertia for like learning new skills as an adult. But when necessity is involved, right, you have to learn this thing. Adults, you know, learn just, just as, just as quickly as, as, as kids do. So that, that kind of, you know, I, I had to learn Norwegian. It was part of my job. Um, and I was kind of just like dunked in it 
and, and you're in that environment. Yeah. So, so that, that, that can really help if, if people are like, I'm just not getting the hang of this, you know, creating some kind of necessity increases focus, increases engagement, right? That, that, and that helps drive the learning process. And, and for those of you who are listening or watching you know, the video on YouTube, this is an advice that I don't normally give on this platform because it's all about science. But this is what I have learned throughout all these languages that I've learned is that usually when I learn a new language, it doesn't matter whether I learned it when I was in my teenage years or when I'm learning it in a university, I usually hit a hard wall in six months. That six months period is, I'll feel like I'm learning a lot. And then at the six months period, that's when I feel like I know nothing. And then for some reason, something clicked and then I get past that wall. And then suddenly I am formulating sentences and thinking in that language and that really propels me forward. And the, 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 the key for, for me to go through that is p- just pure perseverance and like really speak to your friends who are native speakers and just keep trusting the process. It, it definitely helps. Yeah, kind of, you get to a point where unless you're like, again, almost forced to, to speak in that language and going to a going going to the country or speaking to native speakers and like forcing yourself like there's something about that that certainly accelerates accelerates the process like it's fine to learn from tapes and books if people still learn learn languages like that or from apps say but that kind of like one-on-one engagement with another human in that process really does really does help oh yeah absolutely 100 percent. so um so we talked about the languages we talked about coordination do you think like sports like CrossFit would have the same coordination stimulus like dancing, for example? Uh, yes, I think to an extent, if you're doing the gymnastic component. Mm. When, when I did CrossFit, I did everything I could to avoid the gymnastic component because I just hated it. Like, when, and My shoulders this... hurt just by watching it. <laughs> like, hands, like handstand walks for however long. Um, and, and of course what i'm now embodying is the problem with trying to get adults to learn new skills which is that we hate being bad at stuff like there's there's only That's so a lot many of time, ego with it yeah there's only so many times i want to be face planting against the wall trying to do a handstand push-up um but yes i think if you're doing the complex gymnastic components that's probably going to give a lot of the same benefits but you could probably get the same thing with yoga or dance or you know skateboarding right or playing a ball sport what about video games that's a great question. Um, and so one of my very minor claims to fame, all of my claims to fame are very minor, um, is that when the paper came out, the, 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 the demand paper, Andy Galpin wrote an Instagram post about it, which obviously got a lot more attention than anything else that, or anything I'd said about the paper. But then Joe Rogan talked about the post about my paper on his podcast and the reason why he talked about it was to try and say why video games are good for the brain. Um, and so and you I have up, something to say about it. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I do. Um, and so actually, he's not wrong. Um, and, you know, there's, we can talk about the potential negative. So, so anytime you, you would think about, and we've had questions uh, about this. So we, uh, Josh and I have a, a podcast we recently started called Better Brain Fitness which is a, is a question and answer podcast purely. So people submit questions and we answer them. And one of the questions is about like screen time and video games in kids. And I think the main place where video games become detrimental in kids or in adults, in anybody, is when you're spending so much time playing them that you're then you're not moving enough, you're not sleeping enough, you're not engaging in real human social connection, you're not eating properly, right? Which is that certainly happens but i think that's the negative is when you're doing it so much to the detriment of other behaviors whereas there are studies looking at video gamers in kids so like nine to ten year olds those who are regular video gamers and so playing on average three hours a day compared to those who didn't game at all they had improved executive function which is like response inhibition test like a like a go no go test and improved uh, working memory and they usually use the end back test for that um, and you actually see something very similar in adults. So there was like one study where they randomized them either to play uh, Solitaire or Angry Birds or Super Mario World 3D. 
So like video games, but if it increasing like detail, intensity, you know, kind of stimulus, like the world that you're part of. And as you went up the complexity of the game, the better the improvement in, again, executive function and working memory. So I think video games stimulate all those things, right? There's often a problem solving component. There's a motor skill component. Um, sometimes there's a social component, right? If you're playing Call of Duty or something with a, with a group. So I think actually there's a number of ways, and it's been shown in the research, a number of ways that particularly highly engaging video games can stimulate cognitive function. That's yeah, that's that's great. I mean, um, I I still do to a certain extent, and and it's it's interesting to to see a lot of gamers nowadays. They're also like bodybuilders or like semi pro like bodybuilders as well, because they'll be on their Twitch streaming games, and then they're like, you know, uh, this is my TikTok, which is like my workout programs, and they're like all jacked. So I I'm really appreciating that you know. Growing up as a gamer, like I was the nerd, I was the geek, you know, I was the the, the antisocial, and and now there's just like it's cool to be a gamer, and you know now, um, it's it, do you, what what you find out as a, as a, again as a lifelong nerd, like when you're a kid, it really sucks to be a nerd, but once you're an adult, being a nerd is great. Yes, like, yes, you start to reap all the benefits. I go back, I go back to school, go back to Malaysia, and sometimes they'll ask me to give a speech, you know, to the current student, and I'm like, yeah, sure. And I told them right away, I'm like, the two main things I always say, right? One is, being a nerd, you'll be made fun of now, you'll be bullied, but trust me, eventually these people work for you. They'll either have to answer to, yeah, time will come, and and you will have the knowledge to then apply to yourself and look even better than these people um, because they'll, 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 you know, lose track and they'll slip. Um, so the second thing is that this is, it, it, this is uh, um, to the perspective of, of being Malaysian is that I told, because we're multiracial in Malaysia, we've got Malay, Chinese and Indian. And I told them, you know, us here always debating about different races, about Malays and Chinese and Indians and whatnot. It's such a waste of time because as soon as you leave Malaysia, I, you know, you study abroad, you're just Asian to everyone else. So what's the point? Just focus on yourself, like focus, being proud of being Malaysian or being proud of wherever you're from. Um, and don't focus on skin color or, you know, your DNA because we all humans, we all bleed red. So um, you're just wasting your time in school if, you, if you're just thinking of that, of like racial differences. Um, Speaking of being jacked, for you who do not know, um, you know, Tommy is, is actually jacked. Um, so it, how does being jacked, it, how is that good for your brain? Let's, let's start with that question, shall we? That, that it is a good question. And it's actually a, a surprisingly tricky question to answer. And it's a question that I've tried to answer. And I would love for the answer to be the more jacked you are, the smarter you are. Um, because then that justifies the time that I spend in the gym. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of evidence that suggests that higher muscle mass is associated with decreased cancer risk, decreased all-cause mortality risk, up to an extent, maybe decreased cardiovascular disease risk. But in reality, what I mean by saying more muscle mass is it's like being the top 50% or maybe top 30% of the populations, right? If you look at a room full of people like you being the top, like, you know, demographically, socially, that, like being the top third in terms of muscle mass, which doesn't really take that much muscle mass because nobody is, is lifting weights, essentially. So a small amount of muscle mass is definitely protective. When you then try and dig into this, so um, some students and I, uh, we recently wrote a paper. We'd, we, we'd submitted it a couple of months ago. Hopefully it'll come back from peer review soon. But we, we looked at, um, and you, you if, if you saw my talk at um, the Metabolic Health Summit, this was that was kind of like the start of this project where we took data from NHANES, which is a population data set here in the US. And we took a subset of NHANES. So it was individuals who were over 60 years old and they had a bunch of things that I wanted to look at at the same time. So they had, a DEXA, so we knew how much we, could, we knew how much muscle mass they had. They did a leg strength test, an isometric leg extension. So I had a pretty good measure of strength 
We knew their physical activity levels from a questionnaire. We had a whole bunch of blood tests related to things that might be important for cognitive function. So things like metabolic disease we know. So like the most important predictors of uh, cognitive function in this group were higher blood pressure was associated with worse cognitive function and higher HbA1c was associated with worse cognitive function. We also looked at things like homocysteine. Homocysteine is a really important risk factor for uh, long dementia. And so we looked at all these things and like how they then correlated with cognitive function on a test called the digit symbol substitution test. And what we found was that strength is a really important predictor of cognitive function um, and physical activity was as well. But muscle mass was not at all important. Only strength was important. After you took strength into account, muscle didn't matter. And I was like, I just don't understand what's right. going on here. Right. Um, and it took me a while to grapple with it. But basically what, you know, the, you know, when you sort of keep looking at the data, what you see, and this, so I did all these like multiple regression models where you sort of like regress everything against everything else. So you can kind of see like they become nodes in a network and you can see how the different nodes in the network are related to one another. And what you see is that in this population data set, muscle mass and physical activity were not correlated at all. So, which doesn't make any sense. I was going right? to say, so, were they just, just taking shortcuts? Like, can you please find out what the shortcut is? Because I need, I need them. Well, I'll tell you what the shortcut is. Yeah. The, they had, the, those who had more muscle mass had more muscle mass because they had more total mass. Oh. And so what comes out is that if you want your muscle to be associated with improved cognitive function or health. And there are a whole bunch of mechanisms why that would be the case, blood sugar regulation, release of myokines, neuromuscular stimulus, all this kind of stuff. It, you have to, I believe what the data shows us is that you have to have improvements in strength and function that come with that muscle mass, right? You have to have proportional improvements in muscle function with muscle gain. And that can only come through external muscular stimulus actual like training whereas if you're gaining muscle mass as part of gaining total mass then it's not that muscle isn't functional in the same way and it's probably not as protective in the, in the same way so the muscle mass that you initially um was talking about is the absolute mass and not a percentage muscle mass and then you found out it is a function of the percentage muscle mass correlated with strength and yes yeah so how functional it is so if you if you do something like you re, like you try and predict you can create a linear regression and you predict how much strength you'll have for a given amount of muscle mass right we know that muscle mass and strength are generally linearly correlated right the more muscle you have the stronger you are but then you can look at the difference between how much how strong you should be for a given amount of muscle mass relative to how strong you actually are right because we measured how strong these people were or you know, that was in the data set and what you see is something called the residual. What's the difference between the predicted amount of strength versus the actual amount of strength that person had? And that residual predicted cognitive function quite nicely, which basically says that if you have a lot of muscle, but that muscle isn't very strong, that's associated with worse cognitive function. Or if you have, maybe you don't have a, a ton of muscle, but that muscle is very strong, you have increased function relative to your amount of muscle on average across the population that's associated with improved cognitive function. So what really matters is how strong you are relative to the amount of muscle you have, which is like a, a metric of muscle quality, maybe metabolic health, all this other kind of stuff. I was going to ask, so how can you improve muscle quality in that sense? Uh, let me ask you, before you answer that question, actually, uh, I'm just, I just want to clarify. Now, the increase in strength, is that correlated with the higher percentage of muscle mass or is just purely qualitative? So it doesn't, it doesn't correlate that. It doesn't correlate that well. Well, so the, on average, the more muscle you have, the stronger you are, right? That's just, we, we know that. But within a given individual, it probably matters. Like if I knew their body, all, all their body composition, but I only knew their body composition, right? How much muscle they had, how much fat they had. That, you know, I could predict like an average amount of strength they would have, but actually the, the amount of, muscle function they have is much more related to their physical activity. Um, so you couldn't just predict that just from body composition. So you can have people of all different body compositions, you know, fat mass relative to, to lean mass that have various amounts of strength. And that's the base, that's based on how much physical activity they're doing. 
Oh, so that, that becomes important as well. So that really plays into a role of quali qualitative muscles. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Gosh, so now I can't tell people that I'm just working out to, for aesthetics. Like, don't ask me to lift boxes just because <laughs> I look big. You know, all these muscles are just for show. So I actually have to put in the work in the, in the gym now. Well, the thing is, you, you are, if you're... Uh, if you're in the gym putting in the work, then you're increased. Then I believe you're increasing muscle function. So, so <laughs> then yeah, it's well they can just be for show, but they are doing something useful. Um, th this is important. This this is also important because there's, there's a broader discussion right now, which is that is having or does having more muscle is that worse for your health? Like there's a point where people are saying if you have very high muscle mass, it may you know decrease increase cardiovascular disease risk in particular. There's a there's a study from the UK Biobank that came out recently that showed in men in particular, those with the most muscle mass had the, the high, you know, had a higher cardiovascular disease risk. And everybody's saying like, oh, you know, more muscle like puts strain on the heart, increases your blood pressure, all this kind of stuff. But what's really interesting is that in that same study, they show that the stronger you are, the lower your cardiovascular disease risk. And there didn't seem to be an upper limit. Yeah. So you're making a face and that's exactly right. But I, I, what I think is, is showing exactly the same thing as I found in this other data set, which is that if you just have more muscle because you're bigger in general, but those muscles aren't strong, then yeah, that's a, that's a signal that that muscle isn't as functional. But if you're gaining muscle and functionality, you're getting stronger at the same time, then I don't think there's that same risk associated with it. Now, let me ask you this as well then. How can you build muscle and not strength? Like what... Well, what, I'm just, is I'm there just, a scenario that you would want to do that? No, no, no. I'm just looking out for my audience here, right? If if they are doing something wrong, I want them to identify that and rectify that. So what would you identify as you're doing something wrong here? You are you are increasing your muscle mass, but you're not increasing your strength. What would that so entail? That that scenario is the scenario where you're in a caloric surplus with no physical activity. So as you gain total mass, some of that mass is, is muscle mass. And yes, I think you will gain some strength with that just because you're getting more t total, um, total mass and total muscle. But it's not the same as gaining that same amount of muscle through physical activity or resistance training. So if, you're, if your listeners are lifting weights in any way and, and – Gaining, gaining muscle, muscle that through way. that process, yeah. then that's fine. So it, it's, it, to me, the signal says, again, this is from population data where not a lot of people lift weights, that if you have more muscle, you have more muscle not because you were lifting weights in the gym, you have more muscle because you have more total mass and then you're not getting the same relative improvements in strength and function with that gain in muscle mass. Got it, got it. So increasing lean muscle mass via functional activities, um, that's very important. And, and this is great conversation, great discussion, Tommy. Thank you very much because this is essentially an extension of what I discussed with Luisa Nicola. And I'm sure oh, yeah. you, you know, yeah, know her yeah, because she was on line. here yeah. quite a few episodes ago talking about the 75% um, one rep max resistance training three times a week, increasing BDNF and therefore increasing hippocampus size by I think 16% or something. Um, so, so this basically extended that and, and valid, validate that. Um, and, and so the, the first time that was really shown was not even with resistance training, it was with walking. Mm. Right? There was a, a, a paper, Ericsson, uh, PNAS, uh, more than 10 years ago now where they had individuals in their 60s do brisk walking for 40 minutes three times a week, and they saw a significant increase in BDNF and a significant increase in hippocampal size. So it doesn't even take that much, right? Even small amounts of physical activity, like brisk walking, is, is enough to see improvements. Now, I mean, I think you should lift weights as well. But, you know, I think that's that's. that's I mean, from our conversation, like clearly yeah. everyone should be lifting weights. <laughs> Everybody should be lifting yeah, weights. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's so, super interesting because we always thought that our brain will stop maturing and stop growing late 20s, right? Like, it, But the fact that people can grow their hippocampus um, and going back to what you said earlier about how adults and elderly can learn and can grow certain parts of our bodies when we're given the right stimulus and the right mindset. It's super, super interesting because when I did my research around sarcopenia, which is muscle loss due to aging, 80, 90 year olds experience increase in muscle mass when they were doing resistance exercise. And we thought, you know, oh, it's just old age. We can't, you know, I can't put on muscles. But these 
elderlies are actually putting on muscles because of the rehab that they were going through and hence increasing their survivability from getting from falling basically so yeah and, and so I, I think one of the most damaging pernicious stories that we tell people is that as you get older your brain function only gets worse your muscle function only gets worse you only get weaker you only get stupider for once of one of a better word you, your memory becomes worse and that's yes on average that is true but that's because we stop stimulating our brains just like we stop stimulating our bodies you can take individuals in their 70s put them on a resistance training program they improve their muscle mass and they improve their cognitive function right it's so it's, it's never it's really never too late uh to make improvements here and the body is always adaptable it's always plastic um you know regardless of of like of how old you are and when 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 tommy says plastic it doesn't mean you know plastic in terms of si i mean it's, silicone it's able to, it's or plastic able to adapt and make new connections yeah, yeah. sorry that's a, it's a brain that's, that's a brain thing that's a brain thing that's why i had to, had to point it out when when you say plastic <laughs> the body is plastic it's the plasticity of the cells being able to adapt to stimulus that's what we're talking about um and and this is super interesting because you know of course, we can't stop death. We can't stop, you know, uh, uh, certain diseases from happening like cancers. You know, it, it, we're still trying to figure out like how and when and, you know, why and all of that. But ultimately, we know for a fact that one, we will die one day and two, we will grow old. But as to whether we are going through that old age with higher quality of life, that is within our hands. And that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, and everyone should, in terms of, you know, give yourself the stimulus that you need, either brain stimulus or body stimulus to prepare yourself for those those years, right? Uh, and so you, you're right. If, if you look at, and there's, there's an interesting thing, I've, I've also uh, played with some, some data from powerlifters. Um, there's, some, there's, a, there's a lot of actually powerlifting data out there. And, and what you see is that if you look at strength in the general population and in powerlifters, the rate of decline of strength, like in percent per year, once you get past your sort of 30s to 40s, is actually very similar, right? If you compare active competitive powerlifters, and there's data going out to like people who are in their 90s showing up to powerlifting competitions, which is amazing. Um, but you see the rate of decline is very similar. But what you also see is that in powerlifters, and these people are, are training regularly, right, if they're competitive powerlifters, their curve is massively shifted so you kind of have to like fudge the data to compare a powerlifting squat to like leg press in a population data set but what it looks like is that those who are actively engaging in regular resistance training and we know that they are because they're powerlifters they get to the same strength so if you have a uh, the average strength like leg press strength of a, of a 60 year old or a 65 year old in the population the the powerlifter will reach that same level of strength in that if they're like 15 20 years older so like 75 80 wow. so even though you can't stop the decline by increasing the stimulus and increasing your total capacity you can extend the number of years before you get to a certain level of strength by you know 15 or 20 years right it's, it's a huge effect you know just just by creating providing this regular stimulus that's like greater quality of life for like 15, 20 years. That's huge. Imagine the time that you can spend with your family, with your loved ones, with people around you, where you can walk, you can run, you can go travel around the world. And that's usually when we're free, when we can actually travel the world because hopefully we won't retire, but we'll be working remotely, you know. You know? Or, if, or if you have retired, <laughs> replace it with dancing and weightlifting and yeah. a musical instrument and learn a language and learn so you a new can language. travel to another country. There you go. There you go. Those are really good takeaways. You know, um, yeah. And, and as we are, you know, coming into time here, um, it has been a great conversation, Tommy. Thank you so much. As I would expect, um, you know, um, a lot of uh, takeaways, a lot of strong signs that you're showing and it's really in line with what HVMN podcast is about, what we always discuss on this channel. And, if there are any um, trials or anything you would like to promote, I would like to open the floor uh, for you to tell our audience. So, so we don't. I don't think we currently have any open, open trials. Um, there's a there's a, a trial that I'm sort of partially involved with, looking at um, very like individuals with very high uh, cholesterol who are otherwise metabolically healthy, and looking at their their um, 
the coronary artery plaque uh, mm-hmm. because that's obviously relevant to people on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. But we have finished recruiting that study. All the other work we're kind of doing is either in, like I mentioned, stuff in the lab or with population data sets. Oh, any other thing you want to promote, like even your podcast or whatnot, feel free and, how, and tell them how can they find you as well on uh, social media. Great. So thanks very much. So uh, the Better Brain Fitness Podcast with myself and Dr. Josh Turknet. Um, you can look it up. It's where, all the places where you find podcasts. Listen, obviously listen to this one first and then, and then go over there. Um, and you'll find a link associated with that podcast. So you can go online and you can either record a voice question or you can type in a question. Um, and then I usually post my studies, my podcasts, you know, published papers, that kind of stuff on my Instagram uh, at Dr. Tommy Wood. So you can find me there. I'm pretty good at responding to like direct messages. So if you have a burning question or something, you can message me there. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty good. I'm working on a book, but I that will be uh, a few months a few months away yet. But once Only a few once months. it's out or it's coming out, hopefully you'll have me back. Nice, of course, I would love to. Um, um, we got still. I mean, we I feel like we just touched the surface on on the brain and all that. And hopefully by then as well, we'll have the pilot study data on TBI and ketone IQ. So that would be really cool to discuss with you and pick your brain on what you think, um, you know, about the protocol, about the results, about the, the conclusion that we draw. So. I'm, I'm really excited about ketones in traumatic brain injury. And, you know, there's a bunch of animal work that supports the idea. I think some mechanistic work that supports the idea, but there just haven't been good human studies published yet. So I'm excited to see that. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Tommy. And I will catch up with you soon. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everybody.